Colonel, are we on the brink of another world war? And what does that mean? What does the conflict mean given all the issues that the U.S. faces at home? Uh, I guess you're saving the easy questions for last. <laughs> Uh, I don't think we're on the brink of a third world war, but of course I could be wrong. That's happened once or twice in my life. I think <clears throat> what we're really dealing with right now is the potential for something which is localized to become regional. And the problem is this, that you have two irreconcilable sides. Uh, you, you're not going to get anywhere with uh, Mr. Netanyahu and his government, and you're not going to get very far with Hamas and its supporters. So the point is, <clears throat> the best that you can hope for in the short run is some sort of ceasefire that gives us breathing space. But thus far, <clears throat> there's been no willingness on the part of uh, either Mr. Netanyahu or Hamas to let up. Now, why are, why are we saying a regional war? <clears throat> this is a very different set of circumstances from the conditions that existed in 1973, which is really the last time that Israel confronted a major war. They've had instances of fighting in, in southern Lebanon in 82 and subsequent to that off and on, but not a major conflict on the scale of the 73 war. This has the potential to move in that direction. But the region has changed. Not only is the region more capable in other words, even the Arab states are more capable. And not only are there new technologies involved, but we now have Iran and especially Turkey standing on the sidelines, both of whom could enter this conflict. And that would have very serious consequences for Israel and for us. So what we would like to do, I think, I think with the Biden administration now a little late to the game, obviously, but what they would like to do is contain the conflict. Unfortunately, their diplomacy has been an enormous failure. Wherever Blinken has gone, he's left things worse than they were before he showed up. And I think the situation now is really quite serious. And we don't have any leadership in the White House. Historically, when we were afraid that the Israelis would go too far or their opponents might, we had a president in the White House who personally intervened and said, that's enough, this far and no further. We, we have nothing like that. So the Israelis really have the proverbial blank check from uh, President Biden, similar to what uh, the German emperor gave to the emperor of Austria-Hungary in 1914. That, of course, was a serious mistake. And uh, that's what we're afraid of right now, that things will rapidly spin out of control. Well, things could certainly escalate. And I was curious... What do you have to say, Colonel, about all the emotions out there on both sides, people wanting retribution for the civilians <clears throat> killed? I know you've talked about the notion of collective punishment and how that can breed new enemies. So what should people know? Well, gosh, what should people know? We could go back over the history and there's plenty of blame on each side for the current tragedy. But if you go back to the Camp David Accords, which some of your viewers will remember, there was a discussion between Menachem Begin, who at the time uh, was the prime minister in Israel, and uh, President Sadat of Egypt. And Menachem Begin actually offered control of Gaza to Egypt. He said, you know, you're Muslim Arabs. Why don't you take control of it? We don't want it. It's a tinderbox. In other words, it's a catalyst for conflict. And President Sadat said, not on your life. We don't want Gaza. Now, why would he say that? Well, for two reasons. Number one, his own society was fragile. Let's be, let's be frank. And he was not comfortable with suddenly admitting a couple of million more people who might come in and destabilize his own population. That's, that's not unusual in the Arab world. You can find the same attitude in Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, Jordan, and so forth. But then there's another dimension to this that needs to be understood. If in fact, he had taken the Muslim Arabs off Menachem Begin's hands during the Camp David Accords, that would have weakened the argument for a Palestinian state. And it has been in the interest of the Arabs in the region to keep this dream of a Palestinian state alive because it's a way in order to contain Israel, to weaken Israel, and to suppress Israel as a major power in the region. So that, that's what you have to have in the background. Now, in the meantime, living in Gaza has been no picnic. 
It is being referred to as the largest open air prison or concentration camp in the world. Uh, that's a pretty grim description, but it's not entirely wrong. The other thing that people don't understand is there are many Arab Christians also living in Gaza, Orthodox and Roman Catholic for the most part. They too have become targets and many of them have also been killed and they certainly are not seen as Hamas terrorists. But Israel is not in a position at this point to conduct what we would call discretionary warfare. They're determined to root out and destroy Hamas, and if the population doesn't get out of the way, then they're going to die right along with Hamas. So that brings us back to where we were. We are not doing anything to stop this. Mr. Netanyahu has more control over his destiny and ours than we do. You know, this has never been true in the past. In the past, the president of the United States was always the more powerful of the two figures. Today, given the influence that Israel has gained over many, many years on the Hill and inside American politics, they now hold the trump cards, not the president. So I don't expect anything to change uh, until Mr. Netanyahu decides he's finished. Uh, that opens the door to the regional war that we're discussing. Well, America certainly isn't that superpower that it was once so known for. And I actually want to turn a little bit to our global economic status. Um, I want to read to you one of my favorite quotes from John Quincy Adams. Wherever the standard of freedom and independence has been or shall be unfurled, there will her heart, her benedictions and her prayers be. But she goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. Now, I believe that great nations are really built on strong economies, but they can destroy themselves pursuing this seduction of a foreign empire. And I think that's what's happened with the US. Our economy and prosperity once represented this powerful idea of the American dream. We were the beacon of hope around the world. That was really our strength and our national security. So can you share how our economic demise has contributed to what's happening in the world? Well, let's keep in mind that George Washington and Alexander Hamilton both said that America's mission in the world was to be its engine of economic prosperity. They thought that if you built up our economy and demonstrated how successful we were, that others would want to emulate us. Well, we, we threw that away during the Second World War and in the 50, 60, 70 years since the Second World War. We effectively became an imperial state after World War II. Now, we spent a lot of time explaining why. Much of that had to do with the terrible destruction during the Second World War that left essentially uh, the Soviet Union as the principal winner of the war in terms of territory and power and influence. We then had to fill the vacuum for Japan and Germany. And this ballooned over many decades into a global presence with 800 bases and so forth. When you look at our economy, at the same time as we were growing in, in imperial terms, we were hollowing out our economy. We were shipping uh, our manufacturing base overseas. When I say we, I'm talking about the ruling elites who saw you know, money to be made, frankly, by shipping it over to countries like China with cheap labor. The interesting part is that now China's in a lot of trouble economically. And in part, that's because cheap labor doesn't exist in China anymore. And uh, some of the manufacturing uh, corporations and bases have moved from China into other parts of Southeast Asia. Now, as far as we're concerned, we've also destroyed our energy sector. And if you look at our trump cards in, in economic terms, number one was always the energy sector, our ability to extract, refine, outperform everyone in the energy sector. Secondly, uh, I would argue agriculturally, you know, we have a very productive agrarian sector, and I think we've let that down quite a bit. And then finally, high-tech manufacturing. All of that was once again stupidly uh, exported elsewhere, so that now it sits in Taiwan, for instance, uh, as opposed to sitting in the United States. Those things have to be reversed, and that was part of what Donald Trump wanted to do. This particular administration has followed the opposite path, and actually doubled down on those bad decisions and reverse things, made things actually worse. Let's look at the, the war though and its potential impact. Let's worst case it. If Iran is dragged into this war, and, and I think it could happen, 
and I, I can't predict how or where or what, but we have sent a lot of naval power over to the Persian Gulf and the Indian Ocean. That's an opportunity. Then you have the uh, naval power in the Mediterranean. If, if they are dragged into the war, I think you can say with absolute certainty that the Straits of Hormuz will be shut down. Then you have to consider the possibility that if Egypt finally throws in its lot or casts its lot with the rest of the Arab states against Israel, thus far it has not done that. It has condemned Israel, but it has worked very hard to avoid being dragged into war, especially if the Turks come in, because I think the Egyptians would come in if they received uh, guarantees from the Turks, then you lose the Suez Canal. We haven't even talked about the other oil pipelines coming through Azerbaijan and down through Turkey and into uh, into Israel or the offshore drilling in the Mediterranean and exports from Libya and, and Egypt. That's catastrophic. Then you're looking at $200 a barrel of oil, which is far worse than everybody's anticipating perhaps $100 a barrel now. Well, if those things happen, it's $200 a barrel. And then all bets are off, you know, every, all, just, you know, pick your scenario, whatever you want to find. Now, <clears throat> this is also why I have invested in digital currency, <laughs> but we don't need to go into that right now. But the, but the bottom line is uh, that's worst casing it, but it's not impossible, which is again, anyone who is sober minded and looks at the global situation doesn't want this war. I would tell you the Chinese absolutely don't want it. They're, almost entirely dependent on food and a large part of their energy coming from Africa and the Middle East. How do they get it there? Well, they've got to move it by sea. If there's a major war in the area and the U.S. Navy is involved, it's going to be very hard to get that through to China. Uh, so then, you know, China sits on the, on the sidelines and says, we've got to have a negotiated settlement, gets into arguments with the, with the Israelis over what they're doing. There was a huge argument very recently within the last few hours in the United Nations and the public uh, arena saying, look, there are rules in war. You are not following any of them. You've disregarded all the rules that we have tried to adhere to. Well, to be, let's be honest, war is war and rules don't count for much once you get into an existential fight. And for the Israelis, it's an existential fight. But making it an existential fight for them <clears throat> tends to make the fight elsewhere for the Arabs, Turks, and Iranians also existential. And that's the problem. And, you know, we're seeing so many cracks around the edges, what you talked about with uh, the price of oil, how that could be impacted. America has enjoyed such a privilege being the global reserve currency, essentially being able to print oil with the petrodollar, but that's changing. Um, and you you recently made a series of very unprecedented predictions. You've said that Biden may not complete his term, but you also said that you think that we will wake up one day very soon and have a bank holiday where we won't be able to access any of our accounts. And you mentioned digital currency. So I want you to expand a little bit on that forecast of yours, because knowing that you are an advocate for Bitcoin, for this freedom technology, could that be an escape hatch? Yes. Uh, particularly if it turns out that our fiat currency at some point uh, is called into question. Again, we can come up with many scenarios, but you've got Lynn Alden, uh, Alistair McLeod, uh, a host of others who are far better informed than I am are talking about the fragility of our banking system. And we continue to see problems. If you look at the top 10 banks in the United States that are critically weak, uh, they include some of the largest banks in the world. If, if any of those for any reason run into a critical situation, the world economy is in serious trouble. We even had uh, Jamie Dimon has talked about the fragility of the system and the dangers that, that are lurking out there. You know, I can't predict when, how or what. All I can do is look at triggers. And my point is Ukraine was bad. But effectively, everybody lied to everyone else in the West and said that was going to be a big success. That's a total failure. That's vanishing from the screen right now. We're, we're pouring money into it to maintain the facade that the Ukrainian state is viable and not a total failure. That's for political cover in Washington and Western capitals. But the war there is effectively over. The Russians are advancing. They will determine Ukraine's future, not us. And it's certainly not going to be in NATO. 
or the EU, I rather suspect. So now we've shifted the Middle East, a totally different arena, but I would argue the stakes there are even higher and the consequences for the global economy are far more grave. So, you know, the trigger is quite frankly, if Iran and or the Turks become involved, and I think the longer this lasts, the more likely that is, every conceivable scenario that crashes the global economy and particularly our economy in the West is very likely. The BRICS will probably survive this more easily. Russia is flourishing at this point. And in fact, in many respects, it would be in its interest to dump fiat currency entirely and go to the gold standard. We'll see what they do. You know, we still have Chinese that are shedding treasuries, U.S. treasuries, but they haven't gone to the fire sale and essentially dumped everything. If we get a fire sale overseas from Saudi Arabia and, and China regarding U.S. treasuries, I think we're in a lot of trouble. Well, what is this bank holiday that you mentioned? Like, how would that actually play out? Well, I think you're referring to uh, something where I said the banks could close for a couple of weeks, or are you talking about the debt holiday I discussed? Uh, you, we could go into both. I, I thought that you mentioned that you thought that one day people wouldn't be able to access their accounts. And, and that is that censorship, that financial censorship we have seen in other countries, including Western countries like Canada, obviously Cyprus and others. People literally can't access their own money that they think is in the bank. Um, can you touch on that? Well, remember, during the Depression, we shot down uh, the nation's banks for two weeks because the runs on the banks threatened to destroy the whole system. I think we could see simply something similar. Just as we shut down trading on Wall Street, you know, we can push a button and simply halt all trading to prevent another total crash. I think you could see something similar happen in the banking system. Again, what's the trigger for it? You know, uh, I, I can't predict when the black swan will take flight, to put it bluntly. But I think James Ricards and others have all mentioned these kinds of things. Now, when it comes to debt holiday, this is something that I think deserved some time ago a lot of attention and never got it. In the Middle Ages and during the Renaissance, when everyone was burdened with debt that they could not possibly retire under any circumstances, the, the king emperor, you know, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire or the king of the Polish Lithuanian uh, Congress could simply say, debt holiday, all debts are forgiven. In other words, the clock goes to zero, we start over. Well, the bankers are utterly opposed to that because it would ruin them. They would go out of business. And that brings us to digital currency. You know, when it becomes clear that the banks are not solvent, when it becomes clear that we have debt that is so large that it cannot be retired, then you begin to question how much is your cash worth? Now, initially, I think we're going to see the dollar very strong, which is obviously not too good for our economy. It will go on that way, maybe it's six months, maybe a year, maybe longer. And then suddenly I think it'll tank. You know, again, th these are prognostications based on previous history. If that happens, and I think it could, digital currency becomes an option, a better option as a store of wealth. Again, the banks hate this, want nothing to do with it, but they may not have much control. The whole central banking system has reached a point where it is corrupted by by borrowing and toxic debt and off uh, you know off balance sheet debt. I mean, there's it's a it's a mess. I wouldn't want to be in the Federal Reserve or on its board for anything in the world right now. Well, this all all goes to what you've been saying that the U.S. really could be facing an existential crisis, all caused by our excessive spending and debt, the fact that we're bankrupt in so many places, the rule of law has been destroyed. Earlier, we mentioned the deteriorating military strength, all of these rising geopolitical risks. But, you know, again, touching back on what I said at the top, our country, our choice. You do have hope that we can bring people together and restore America to its economic greatness and prosperity. So who is going to rise to that occasion and defend our way of life? Well, first of all, I think uh, Americans ought to get out of this business of looking for a messiah to rescue them we're going to have to rescue ourselves. That means we're going to have to have more responsible people governing this country than the ones who are currently there. In 1932 and again in 34, FDR effectively defaulted. 
what he did is that he said, we have to restructure our debt and told our creditors that we would pay our debt, but we had to restructure the payments. The only way that we can do that, and the only way he was able to do it, well, he was able to do it for two reasons. First of all, he had an enormous amount of gold pouring into American banks from people that owed us money from the First World War. We don't have that advantage right now. The second advantage that, that he had is that he could stop spending money in certain key areas. We have to cut spending. Show me someone out there who's going to stand up and say, I'm sorry, but we simply can't afford $4.5 trillion on an annual basis for Medicare, Medicaid, uh, Social Security. Well, nobody's going to do that. We already know that the annual payment on servicing the debt right now is roughly a trillion, a little bit short of a trillion or equal to the cost of our defense in this country. So initially people say, oh, well, let's go to defense. We'll cut that. Well, that's not going to get you very far. You have to tackle the 4.5 trillion. Nobody wants to do it. So I predict that we'll do what happened in Sri Lanka. We'll all go over the cliff because no one wants to cut anything. Now, once that happens, I think you'll see Washington simply stand around uh, with nothing to do and no one to talk to. And that's when you're going to see a kind of economic, financial, societal implosion. What happens at that point is anybody's guess, but I can tell you one thing. If I were an American looking into the future, into the sort of looking glass, and I saw this com coming, the first thing I would say is, Whoever we put in charge, they can't come from within the beltway. Anybody who's there now needs to go away. So that's that's rule number one. And rule number two is don't bring anybody in from the Ivy League schools or the service academies. Those are the people that brought us to this point. That leaves plenty of Americans, but that's not something anybody inside the beltway wants to hear. And that's not something people inside the beltway are going to do. You know, it's really sad that there does seem to be no appetite for making the long term decisions. And we just think about the short term, the next election, spending our way into, you know, the next budget crisis. And a lot of people feel like they're not represented anymore. The distrust that the American public feels in Congress and politics in general is at, I think, an all time low. And I think you take a lot of risk sticking your neck out there because you you share thoughts that no doubt rile some of the powerful interests um, and they have a history of silencing their critics. So why, why do you do that? Well, our country, our choice, which is something I joined. I did not found it. Others founded it and asked me to come in as CEO. The reason I did is that these people that founded it, who were initial investors to help build this organization, said something that resonated strongly with me, said, you know, we vote Republican, we vote Democrat, we vote Republican, we vote Democrat. It doesn't make any difference. The outcome in Washington is the same, disaster after disaster after disaster. They also concluded, and I agree with them, that there are plenty of people, Democrats and Republicans, that really adhere to what I would call traditional conservative values and view themselves as first and foremost Americans. Mm -hmm. And this is very important because one of the things that we've witnessed in this country is the weakening of our citizenship, the notion of citizenship, the obligations of citizenship, and that is bound up with our identity as Americans. So this is an organization that rose from, so to say, those origins and said, first of all, we want a true American first policy at home and abroad, which means we want prosperity at home and we want peace abroad. We want to withdraw our forces from all of these pointless locations, stop getting our soldiers killed and wounded for nothing, stop wasting money trying to transform the world into some sort of facsimile of us. Instead, let's look at the rest of the world from the standpoint of mutual respect. If we want people to respect us, we have to respect people who are different from us, who govern themselves differently from us, who have a different culture from us. There's nothing wrong with that. It may not be exactly as we are, but then again, we know that we are imperfect. We've strayed quite a bit from where we began, and we have to get back on track. We can't get back on track as long as we're entangled 
in all these alliances overseas. And these alliances are not protecting us. They're dragging us into wars that we don't need to fight. Well, I think you're touching on something a lot of Americans feel that we've really stuck our noses into everyone's business around the world. Everyone sees us as a bully. And going back to what we mentioned earlier, a foreign empire abroad is not compatible with a strong democracy here and a strong economy. And we've lost a lot of that. We should be an example as opposed to forcing our way upon everyone else, be that economic strength and prosperity for others to look at and want to emulate themselves and let them make that choice. Um, so as we start to wrap up, Colonel, it's just such a pleasure to have you on because you really are a voice of reason in this, in this very confusing and tumultuous time. Is there anything that you haven't been asked in all of these interviews that you do that you really think should be discussed? I think I think it might be useful at this point for everyone to understand something. I, like most Americans, would like to see Israel survive. We believe Israel has a right to exist, and it should exist. We're worried that what the Israelis are doing right now is putting themselves at risk unnecessarily. That by these extreme measures in Gaza are essentially forcing cohesion on multiplying enemies beyond their borders. And that's very dangerous because as you pointed out at the beginning, we are weaker today than we were 30 years ago. We have serious problems here at home, but our armed forces are a shadow of their former selves. And we are not organized or equipped or trained, frankly, to fight differently. What we've seen in Ukraine is a paradigm shift in warfare. We haven't come to terms with that and we're not going to come to terms with it quickly. So the right answer is we need to withdraw, to retire backwards. In other words, retrench, because we are not prepared right now for a major war in either Europe or the Middle East. We ought to be finding a road to peace as quickly and as expeditiously as possible, because we're really not prepared to fight. You, you can't make commitments to do a whole variety of things when the means to meet those commitments don't exist. Right now, those means are no longer available. We have serious problems here at home. That doesn't mean abandoning Israel or anybody else, but it means impressing on them the criticality of finding a third way forward. Get out of this either or, either we win or they win, and there's nothing in between. If we can do that, then I think there's hope, but I'm not sure we can. I wish I could sit here and say, these two irre irreconcilable sides can find a way forward. I, I don't know. Right. Well, in military, especially in war, when the stakes are highest, you have to put aside emotions. And it seems like that's the one thing that we can't do. And social media provides us with the perfect place to vent them and for misinformation to spread, certainly down the line with more and more AIs. It's it's like you you can doubt everything that you see and, and you don't know what the truth is. But but on the emotional side, how what is your advice for people to take that away and just make a sound decision? Because this is this is where I think people are getting really mixed up. Well, we use the word democracy, but in reality, we are a republic. People vote for people to represent their interests. Now, we know that the people we voted into office in most cases have not represented our interests. If I were to pull, say, 5,000 Americans randomly into a stadium and ask them, do you want to go to war here? Do you want to go to war there or somewhere else? I, I think they would overwhelmingly say no. We can look at the polling data over the 20th century. In virtually every case, Americans were opposed to overseas entanglements and war. So that's not really the issue. The issue is, how do we get control of our government? How do we get people in Washington who represent our interests. And one of the things that you have to do if you're going to represent other people's interests is set aside your own emotion, control it. You know, I remember sitting in a, in a meeting with several four stars, British, German, and American, and this particular officer stood up and gave this very passionate speech about what he thought was appropriate. And the British four star said, control yourself. We're not interested in emotion. We want facts, uh, that's what we need. We need facts, less emotion. And instead of condemning one side or the other, if we can get the facts, then there's a chance that we can find this 
middle road, at least temporarily. Once you get people to stop killing each other, at least for a while, things can improve. It's not a perfect outcome, but until you stop killing each other,